Today, I'm going to talk about the, some of the exciting work that uh, we have been working with Rush um, University Medical Center on biological planning for high dose rate um, brachytherapy and also specifically the application to cervical cancer treatment. We've been working with uh, Dr. Li Not for right over two place. years now on a project uh, using PET image guidance to deliver high radiation dose to the patients with the cervical cancer. We are very honored that our collaborating team under the leadership of Dr. Li, uh, Dr. Kyo, and myself has been selected uh, as one of the Wagner Award finalists. One of the vaccine challenges in radiation oncology is uh, how to deliver a high dose of radiation to the tumor, but at the same time minimizing the dose to normal tissue and and such that those doses will be within acceptable limits. So we look at the cancer, basically, the, the work is about. So in the United States in 2012, the, it's estimated that about 1.6 million cancer cases, and that resulted in about half a million deaths. And that among these patients, about 750,000 will receive some form of radiation treatment. And worldwide, and that's about like 12.6 million that is diagnosis in, uh, like estimated in 2011, and that over 7.5 million deaths. So it is still very high mortality across the world, and that over 8 million of these patients receive some form of radiation therapy treatment. So the treatment modalities basically is really based on uh, the tumor staging, the size of the tumor, whether the patient wants to uh, have a child or not, and also depending on the age of the patient. And so there are really three standard type of treatment. Whether we have done lots of advances in cancer, but there are still three basic ones that include the sur surgical procedure and uh, radiation therapy as well as chemotherapy. So radiation therapy has an advantage in a sense that if you see cancer advances and all the new drugs come and go, radiation is the only one that have stayed all these years. Part of the reason is because it's organ preserving. So you don't have to remove the organ, you can actually keep the organ and you, ha you can apply radiation from external beam or you can also put seeds inside through the implanting the seeds inside or put it through the tubes. And it can actually give you very high dose in the surrounding tissue of the tumor and then avoid the high dose to the normal tissue. So it is used as definitive treatment, that means that's the only treatment that is used, or as adjuvant treatment, that means you can have surgery, you can have chemotherapy, and you actually use radiation therapy on top of that. So today I'm going to focus on high dose ray uh, brachytherapy, even though the technology that we have actually developed is applicable to the entire field of radiation therapy, it's not possible to talk about all of this, so I want to focus on just a high dose rate. So this one basically is a temporary seed implant. You put uh, cavities in the body, and then the, the radiation seed is being deposited in, in a very definitive place, and it is being used um, in many different sites, surgical, um, as cervix cancer, prostate, brain, and we even use it for uh, patients with heart disease when the uh, artery is blocked, you put a seat there and you blast it open, and of course you take the radiation seat out afterwards. So basically the entire treatment lasts only for like five days, five to ten days, and it is very high radiation dose. That means the patient actually will be isolated in a room, and the doctor actually is in another room that's robots that is handling all those and with the computer. So it is more desirable than the low dose rate um, permanent seat implants for the following reason is that um, you have to carry those seeds in your body, and in some places you simply cannot put a permanent implant. So here I'm showing you three different types of um, high dose rays, and the first one is for prostate cancer, because these are the most common one. Use prostate cancer, these are catheters, and you put the seed inside. This is cervical cancer, and basically this uh, apparatus is being placed inside the vagina, going up to the surface, and then that's the treatment, and that's actually, this is the uterus. It is also used for uterus cancer. Now, it's a little bit easier for me to show you how it works uh, in the breast because the organ is outside. So basically, this is the, one of the most uh, effective treatment for breast cancer, early stage breast cancer. When patient has a small lump removed, and basically they are being given high dose ray, uh, radiation, so you numb their breast, and that overlay with where the tumor has been removed, and then you put the catheters in, 
million patients actually get the radiation. This one has 99% curity rate. It's unbelievable. It's the most successful clinical trials that we have. So the advantages over permanent implants is that this improved treatment design means and translate directly to improvement in the tumor control. Because you have a very fixed tube, you put the seed right there, it will not move. So instead of like putting it inside the organ and actually the seed is moving. So it is very exciting in a sense that if you really can do a good job, you see a really, really nice result. It does not trigger the uh, metal detector. A lot of prostate cancer patients, unfortunately, they are the large group with the uh, seed implants. They actually could not go through the airport um, area without being uh, like being pulled aside because the uh, heavy metal in the body that remain in the body will actually trigger the detector. And some of them were not being given a very nice, uh, like, were not being treated too nicely, and I think that was unfortunate. The last, the second last part is the most important. It is preserving, not just preserving the organ, it is preserving the functioning of the organ. And that makes it really different, is that you cannot really put seeds in the breast, and, but on the other hand, if you put high dose rate on the, on the breast for treatment, the, actually you can breastfeed the baby. So it makes a huge difference for the patient, and simply many sites you cannot put permanent seeds inside. So the, this one I showed you how it works here basically is you have the um, the surface uh, cancer here. You select the type of seed to use and, and then you select the apparatus. Then you insert that inside the uh, surface area and, and then you can see during the treatment, you can actually see it in uh, imaging of all the seeds, how they look. And the good thing is this is exactly what the doctor always tell us. You deliver and you actually receive exactly what you deliver. So that is really the precision that we get. So the challenge here is that where do you place these seeds? And what type of seeds to place? How long do you put these seeds in? Now we have to worry about the time, right? Because we don't just keep it inside the body. And how do you actually maximize the tumor control and at the same time minimize the the um, radiation to the critical structure. And we always understand when it, we treat cancer, there's always a very critical structure right next to the tumor. So you really cannot just kill everything. So now, along with the high dose rate radiation, there's also a lot of exciting activities about brain um, imaging and functional imaging. So here's to show you, this is the CAT scan that is for treatment. This is the surface area. This is the bladder. I, I know it is probably not so easy for us to see it, right? With the doctor, they just Sucker, uh, here's the surface is a great. It's a little bit hard to see, but if you actually look at the pet image, what you see is that this is the bladder, and this is your surface, and this little spot is where the cancer cells actually deposit. So basically, pet image gave you the met metabolism of all the tumor cells. It tells you precisely where they actually are distributed. So that means now, truly, if you can deliver the treatment, you can give them personalized treatment exactly locating the, the radiation to the to these particular pockets. We have conducted a clinical trial for patients with a cervical cancer to study a special new treatment approach to meet this challenge. The treatment will be under the guidance of PET images and uh, computer optimization programs. And that's the computer optimization programs that I will discuss. To use today. PET scans and treatment planning in brachytherapy for cervix cancer. We use the PET scan, overlay that with our usual treatment planning with CT scans, and we outline active tumor. This is very important because we have no other modality to use for treatment planning. Um, we think that this has great promise in the future as treatment planning for cervix cancer has become more and more precise with time. Dr. Q is actually the physician that is carrying out the clinical trial. So it is actually quite exciting in terms of when they saw the result and they decided to go ahead with the clinical trials after we actually tested it for one year. And now here before we, we, we look at that, is that, I want to mention to you, here's the uh, overlay of the PET image and you can see distinct different spatial information of the tumor. So let's see what. That CT planning allows better definition of possible active cancer in a way that we do not have with any other modality. For example, in this CT scan, we could barely perceive where cancer might be sitting, and with an M PET scan overlay, we can see bright spots that suggest residual cancer. So these. 
The computer screen that you see is precisely the type of computer screen that is used in the hospital, and they have robots to actually load all these seats, as I mentioned, because human cannot be inside except the patient. So what are the major challenges? There are two major challenges. How do you incorporate this PET image? Now that we are so advanced, how do we actually bring the biological side into the treatment? How do you actually really escalate the dose in the tumor and at the same time saying, don't give me more? Uh, radiation in the rectum and bladder. So we got this passionate discussion. I was at the clinical conference and this doctor. So we talk about all these things in the in just the discussion early uh, result. And this doctor raised his hand and said, Eva, you can deliver more dose to the tumor. You are going to deliver more dose to the rectum and the bladder and everywhere. I said, all right, that's the challenge, right? I don't know if that is really true or not, and we have to try it. So this is, is it clinically possible? From their point of view, it is not possible. And the second part is the major challenge is that Marco Zader actually is my mentor in radiation therapy. He has developed really beautiful biological, radiological, biological results on linking the characteristics of cancer cells and tumor cells on how they respond to radiation. But as you notice, you could be passionate about optimization. This is a very, very ugly function to optimize. So interesting, every time they have these oncology um, like plenary talk. So these radiation oncologists always say, here's the, um, here's the future. Cancer biology is always our future. And then he said, well, I talked about that 20 years ago and now it's 20 years now. When will that happen? Okay, so it is like, I think people are really, really anxious to see this happen. I got really nice result. How can you actually incorporate in the treatment? But that is the only way you can deliver to the patient and give them the benefits. So the challenges, is clear to the OR community. Here, we really understand is that with our exper uh, experience is that we know the resulting problem is 100% dense with the matrix. How do you deal with these problems? Okay, we got some nice uh, idea. Second part is how do you incorporate a really complex tumor control probability within your treatment planning optimization? How do you really make use of that so that you can drive your plan so that you get the best tumor control probability? And of course, the last part is how do you incorporate this PET information within your treatment? So it is really, it really requires a lot of, um, thinking. As I remember, we, we looked at it, we stared at it, and, and I think for, several weeks when I was thinking about it, I said, I said, this is great. Maybe we are really stuck this time. And and I'm not so sure whether we want to give up because I, I'm about to give up there because I think there's so much at stake. If you look at cervical cancer, 30% of mortality for cervical cancer patients, not because it is too late stage, even if it's being diagnosed, it could be failure in terms of the treatment because we simply do not have the best tumor control. So some of the models characteristics, now I'm going to go into describing how do we build the models. I said, first we have the planning target volume, I call it PTV, and that comprises the entire um, area of interest that in this case is the surface. And then we have the enhanced PET uh, image information, and I'm going to call it the boost target volume, the BTV. So basically we have the uh, PTV Include inside is the very specific part that we want to boost the uh, radiation. So the treatment designed and basically we want to be able to prescribe 100% dose to the PTV. We want to escalate the dose to those tumor pockets and we want to ensure that at least 95% of the tumor area receive enough dose. So that's the coverage and that the underdose is not less than 7%. Now this could be different from side to side and this is what we are being advised by the doctor. And we want to be able to keep the upper and lower bound on the critical structure. And the objective is really to seek rapid fall off of the radiation. That means you want the dose to be as tight as possible to the shape of the tumor. And at the same time, you want to maximize the tumor control probability. So the data as an OR person, we basically, this is a pretty um, standard approach is you discretize it into three dimensional uh, points that what we call voxel. And now we describe the D, P, I represent the dose to a voxel P and from a distance, from the seed location at location I. And this is per unit time because when, when you put in the seed, how long it takes and, and that will give you enough um, dosage. There's a variables to denote if you're going to put the seed or not. There's the time, Ti, correspond to how long you're going to put the seed inside. And then there's a dose deviation from the bound. And then there's also binary variables to capture if the bounds are satisfied or not. So I'm going to give you all these general ones. Not all the models include all these um, variables. So the first model, 
Let's see if I can do some mouse properly. Without. So basically, I would like to to uh, mention here. This is the total dose to a point p, and if y p is one, that means it satisfies the lower bound. Right? If it is not, if this is zero, then I want the underdose to be just seven percent of the prescribed dose. Right? So that represents the lower bound for the uh, planning volume. And here, the upper bound. If v p is one, it means it satisfies the upper bound. If it is zero, then you have to subtract. So it's excess amount of um, of dose, and this one basically gives you the coverage, 95%. That's escalating dose on the voxels. That is the PTV. That's the BTV, and then that's the time it you want to to put the seed inside, and that's a, a, a maximum allowance. And then if you put a seed there or not, and then there's the number of seed that you should put in. Now, there is, in a sense, in theory, no control over how many seeds to put in. However, you can see that I put actually cavities inside, right? You, you can put like 20 cavities in the body versus five cavities. So you do not really want to put so many cavities in terms of the delivery. So sometimes the doctors will tell you, yes, I, I want to just only put at most that many seeds, and sometimes they allow you to put many seeds in it. So basically, your goal is really to optimize and find the seed location <coughs> and how long to put them in. So this one basically trying to minimize the maximum drought time, how long you put the seed in. And this one to even out the uh, the dosage across the whole area. And then the second one is to maximize the volume of the target area that receive the, the type of dose that, that they should receive. And then the third really is to maximize the tumor control probability. Now you can make it a little easier by replacing all the zero one indicator in terms of whether the bounds are satisfied or not by just looking at deviation. So now this one, if we look at it, is we we capture the deviation from the target bound and then we we calculate like how many of them satisfy or not. And then here you minimize the square of these deviations. So basically, again, you can put weight on it, and these two objectives remain the same. So these type of problems, in a sense, that um, the challenge is real because you see, even though in the United States some of the cancer cases are going down, but the heart cases actually are very difficult to treat, like pancreatic cancer, cervical cancer, you uterus cancer and a lot of the cancer that we actually are not so good in treating because see, even though there is modality, but not many sophisticated methods have been applied to it. Now, we actually first attack this problem based on the dense uh, property of the problem by looking at just the linear part of it. That means not looking at the objective, you look at the polyhedral theory and trying to come up with it. So this is actually a pretty interesting high dimensional graphs, basically, for each of the nodes corresponding to the x variables and then the edge corresponding to a whole bunch of the nodes. So this is like, these are the edges that, that is cons correspond to that. And then we discover a lot of this uh, hypographic structure that turns out to be really useful to solve very dense uh, MIP, not just for radiation therapy or medical applications. It also is really good for those market share instances. So that's, that has a dual purpose in terms of like, very interesting, the market share instances are 100% dense also, even though it has nothing to do with the bodies. It's about investing on different, um, different type of um, stocks. So the computational engine is most critical because one of the things that the clinicians always remind us is that they appreciate complex model. In fact, they have been complaining that they're not able to model it because they don't have the capability. But once they model it, then of course the next thing they want, give me a solution, right? So that's really a very important part. So basically the input, first we solve the problem by solving the first one. Oh, it scares me. All right. So first you solve the uh, first objective by minimizing the max time of the drought time. And that basically, once you get the drought time, you put it into your constraint and say that means control how long you're going to allow the seed to stay inside. Then you optimize the second and the third objective. Remember, the second objective basically is maximize the volume of satisfying the bounds or minimizing the dose deviation, as well as the TCP, right, the tumor control. So we use the branch and cut and local search. This is kind of a really hard algorithm, but on the other hand, for my students, it's actually kind of fun because it actually has some, like, we kind of create these little um, 
little uh, video to to see how the local search actually is done, and and it is actually is is uh, following the little insects. So inside branch and bound, the, the little insects is going inside this this neighborhood, and then they are going to figure out what is the best solution within that. So it is a very interesting part, and the doctors really love that. See, the doctors like everything more nature oriented, right? So so they say, ah, this is good. This is the bee find the best solution. I said, yes, that's the bee actually indeed. And then we construct a global solution for them, generating the eyes of those curves and DVH and then um, do the uh, calculation and generate the graphs and for them to evaluate. So if you look at inside the second component where we have two objectives, basically we fit in the optimization problem and we split the uh, dose matrix into two parts. For this one, it is really just to make sure the cutting planes is not too dense. So we just split it and so D1, D2, uh, D1 consists of a majority of the coefficient and D2 are the tiny little coefficients that we take out. And then we use this as our branch and cut um, problem. And then as we go through that, we generate cutting planes and then we uh, perform geometric heuristics. And geometric heuristics based on really the seed location as well as how it relates to the normal tissue and critical structure and decide which point to actually set it to one or zero. Then we check if there's an energy solution or not. If there is none, then we go to branching and then we go back the loop again. If there's a solution, then we go into this particle swarm optimization. So you actually have a heuristic solution. But remember, this heuristic solution only know one objective, right, which is the uh, volume or the deviation of the dose. Now you want to get drive this solution towards the best solution that has the best tumor control probability. So these little bees are very busy and, and they got the objective function of like, find me the best solution being influenced by the uh, tumor cells as well as the normal cells. And it's very interesting on the computer, like I, like my students were saying, this is really interesting because the bee keep looking at this and, and, and it's like it's looking for a flower and it actually find the solution and it will pops up and say this TCP is like 95%, it's really happy and then it comes back out. So then it, it basically update the solution and if there's no more, no more sub problems, you return. Otherwise, you basically um, continue the process. So as I mentioned, this is really quite exciting for us because for the longest time, I think for two months, um, I really think, should we go with the uh, objective function or not? And, or should we just abandon it? And then, and then we even joke about, do you want to raise it to power 10 or power 5? Right? The, the doctors, you know, it is funny. Some of these um, objective function, they actually really got this from... Um, biological experiments, they really actually know quite well what those are. But on the other hand, from the optimization point of view, we really don't understand why are you raising it to this power, right? We always want to ask a lot of these questions. So basically, we use our methods and trying to compare the standard method versus the escalated method. We also, in addition to just escalating the dose, we also try to reduce the dose to the PTV to see what type of benefits do we have. So the idea is really to understand, are we doing better after putting all this biological information that is supposed to be personalized right, for each patient and that the solution is supposed to be driven by tumor control? So how do we compare these results? This is for a patient with the uh, volume about 30% of the uh, suffix area is, is, is being highlighted by the um, PET scan. So the first thing you see, this is a very busy uh, figure, is you look at the square boxes. Okay, so the idea, this is a dose volume histogram. So basically, if it is normal tissue, you want it to be as close to the vertical line here as possible. For the PTV, you want it to be far away, and then you want it to be almost uh, vertical. So of course, this is seed implants. That means any of the tumor cells that is, or normal cells that is close to the seed will have very long tail, very high dose. So if you look at the square box, this is the standard, um, this is the standard uh, graph. Then you notice that these standard um, plan actually has higher dose in bladder and rectum. So we proved the clinician wrong. So I can deliver more dose to the tumor and the pet area. At the same time, I push all the dose to the rectum and the bladder further away, right? So I actually deliver a lot fewer dose to the, so that is really good. And one of the things that is really important is that you can always deliver higher dose, but you also kill a lot more normal cells, right? So that's important to us. And this is a tumor that is a little bit smaller. It's about 8%. And again, we see very nice uh, results at that for the bladder and the rectum. And this is the, the green is escalated and this is just the normal pad area. So the one of the things I think the, the doctors really like is from their point of view is that 
when they see it, like I remember when I asked uh, this doctor, how, what, what is a good plan? So his answer is either when I see it, I know it. Ah, it's a great. What if you never see it, right? So when he had to saw this DVH, you say, this is amazing that you get it. So how do you get it, right? Now he's really exciting, excited about that. And, and it is really interesting because the moment they see it, the doctors are really good in actually outlining the curve, how it looks. They say, this is what I want. Okay, but a lot of times what they outline may not be achievable, right? So this time we actually gave them the result, so it looks pretty good. If we look at the tumor control probability, so basically among all the 15 patients that we tested, the standard plans give you about 48 to 65 percent tumor control probability. This, the first one, is the standard one, the plan, and the second one is the plan where I escalated the uh, the BTV with like 37 dose versus 35. So you can see it increase. And it, it basically is greater than 80%. And then now I say, okay, let me reduce a little bit of the PTV. That means now I really zoom in just the, the, the boost area and lower a little bit of the surface area. Ah, it actually increased, right? It is, it's actually quite nice. Now I'm going to boost even more of the uh, BTV. Right? This, now the idea is that if you ask the doctor how high do they want, what do you think? give me as high as you could without harming my normal tissue. You know why? Because cancer cells are radio resistant, right? So they are very resisting radiation. You have to kill them, basically. So you want to give them as high. So if you can actually do that, by all means do it. And then you see it increases. Then we discover, all right, so there is pockets of tumor cells in those pet area, but they are also distributed, kind of like sparsely distributed cancer cells in the um, in the surface area. We want to make sure we catch them. And so basically we, we maintain again the BTV to 35 gray and then we got the very nice result. So this is really this is really a showcase in a sense. You almost want to defend your own field to from the doctor in terms of like they said, how good can optimization be, right? Because in a sense that it is it is not so much about we can do just a standard optimization, but it's how far can you push it and can you really personalize it? And can you really accommodate the true clinical um, equation that we have versus a very simple one? So in this case, basically, this is the standard plan. And as you see the dose, like that's the around, this is the pet um, pocket. And in the pet pocket, and you can see the dose, the red dose of 150. And then this one is the one when I reduce it to 33 gray for the PTV. And so you see it is a little tighter. So we see a very nice um, dose that is uh, showing. So the doctors basically, as I mentioned, it is only one year after we actually do the study, and, and when they saw the result, they, they actually told me they started the clinical trials. Oh, I said, great, because that happened exactly like the prostate when they start doing it. And you know, it, it could, in, in some sense, take a lot of time, but on the other hand, it's also important for them to be willing to try and figure out what's going on. And most important for the patients, they were really happy to be getting the treatment because it means really, really a huge benefit for them. So basically, we find that you can boost the, um, the dose, and if you boost it to 37 gray, you basically see reduction to the uh, dose to the uh, rectum as, as well as bladder, and you can really cover very nice dose to the um, to the pet area and the TCP really increased very nicely and there's very little increase in the dose to the PTV, just very little. And PTV is okay because that still has some cancer cells. And basically if you boost it to a higher dose to like 40 gray, you receive uh, even higher tumor control. Second finding is that you can also lower the dose to the PTV very nicely and essentially you are not losing anything. So, and of course, the radiation to the bladder and to the, uh, to the rectum is really low. So I think that is, that gives the doctors really a lot of emanation in terms of what they wanted to do. So the significance, as I mentioned, really this is the challenge. Someone came to us and for a while we have to really think hard, can we actually do it? So basically we can improve local tumor control and at the same time lower the dose to the radi uh, radiation to the um, rectum and bladder and the critical structure. Something that they never think they could achieve and we were able to achieve it uniformly on all patients that, that has been treated. And the solution return is in seconds. Now this is not like, as I mentioned, the patient 
information is isolated, right? So it's not like you're going to go do real time. But the fact is, if you can do real time, this is exactly what they want. They want to be able to change the plan as they come in and look at the image and do it in real time. And Rush University started the clinical trials in 2011. And the unique challenge, as I mentioned, this is really truly um, a very interesting, uh, complex objective for us to, to look at. This is really the first treatment planning system that incorporate tumor control probability. So we are very lucky in a sense that we are first in the entire radiation area. So everybody want to be able to incorporate it. They want to know what results do they get and we actually prove them. You actually can get very good results. This is also the first time where PET image is being put inside. And of course the key really is that you must really do clinical trials in order to test it on patients. So the significance is really about quality of life and also quality of surface and care. So reducing um, the, like improving tumor control means that it is improving curative rate and lower the mortality. For these patients is indeed very, very important because the mortality rate is very high. And reducing the uh, radiation dose to the tumor, like to the tumor's healthy surrounding tissues means that you reduce the side effect and that means the quality of um, health of the patients, quality of life of the patients, as well as the uh, side effect management. So you, you all know that we spend billions of dollars every year just for every single cancer type that you look at just for side effect management. And so this is really important. And of course, requiring seconds to get tri good plan means that now you really can talk about real-time image guided treatment and adaptive treatment, which means your cancer in terms of designing the plan, you don't just say, okay, now I design the plan and you're going to use it for nine weeks or you're going to use it for five days. You can actually really take the image, do the planning and incorporating what's happening to the cancer right then and right now, and then do the treatment so you get much better results. And as I mentioned, TCP, this is the first time, and, and I think it is, it is exciting as everybody already, we tested now on PRAS day and on breast and got really nice results. So everybody's asking, how do we do it? And so I think this is exciting. I, said, I, I mean, I think if you ask my student, I love his, his reaction when he first saw it. He said, Dr. Lee, are you sure we want to do it? I said, yes, we are going to do it. And I do not know how, I, mean, I do not know how to do it yet, right? At that time. But on the other hand, it takes time to really understand it and, and try to really dive into it. And basically allowing you to do reoptimization is really important. And as I mentioned, this is really the, to the best of the knowledge, actually, this is acknowledged by the field also. Rush is the first and the only site that is actually doing that. And it is really exciting. And you notice they are not wasting any time. But in the clinical side, whoever that is the first really came up as the first, right? So they're not going to wait until someone else is going to say, look, I'm going to do that also. So the one of the things that I think is more general is that it really set the field now. Finally, they say cancer biology really helps treatment because we are able to incorporate them within treatment planning. We're able to see the result. And of course, HDR is very widely used, and now you can talk about personalized treatment itself. In the OR area, I think we are very fortunate for this particular project. It is three areas that we actually were able to advance. First is really the OR modeling. We're able to model the very complex model and incorporate it and try to figure out how do we deal with it. So just face the reality and say, okay, we, we are going to try to come up with something that make it work. And this really results in plants that are very superior. So I think, is it worth it, the effort? The answer is yes, of course, now because we get good results, right? If we don't get good results, I think we still wonder, is really, do we want to incorporate those biological information or should we not? And, and then you start to worry about the, in terms of the limitation of our modeling. So I think this is a very, very, like it kind of showcase to the medical community that there is a lot of OR to it. And also one of the things I like is that, um, as my colleague mentioned now, many of the radiation oncology department are hiring OR people almost all the top places higher. So it is really good. Now they really value the what we can do because they see the results. So I think it is exciting. The modeling also the first to incorporate the PET image in it. So in terms of the uh, theoretical results, I think it really makes us think hard is that OR has always been a field driven by application. So this one, we again faced with the problem 
dance problem. How do you deal with it? And basically, it forced us to look at things a little bit different. And so we come up with the hypergraphic structure. Very interesting、um, results, and we actually were able to solve some really hard finance problem also. So I also have finance company coming in, which is very funny when they say, "Eva, I saw your cancer work. I want you to solve my finance problem." I said, "Okay, are you interested in the money of the?" Cancer or something else, but they basically see a, a a parallel in terms of the problem itself. So I thought, oh, that is very nice. I I appreciate that. And、um, of course, the computational part, as I mentioned, is that there's also always the exact algorithm or branch and cut that we appreciate the beauty and being able to incorporate theory. But now you know very well you got a non-convex objective function. You are not going to say, look, I don't like those little heuristics. <laughs> you really have to. Face them and and incorporate them and make them really a nice, beautiful system that actually works. And I think this part it is really I really appreciate the、um, like all these technology and how we can actually make it work and actually come up with a solution that could allow us to handle very highly、uh, nonlinear complex、um, function. So. Then of course the I have two students working in some of the theoretical work, and one of them really loved this very ugly objective function of very high dimension. So so he actually is going to graduate、um, this、uh, summer, and he's actually looking at all these really really、uh, complex non-convex、uh, objective with multiplication and and exponential, and come up with very nice theoretical results. How do you convexify it, and how do you actually apply that within、uh, cutting plane approach? And I have just. Two slides. The last one, just to talk a little bit about. So as you mentioned, it's a little bit hard to talk about a technology if I don't focus on just one particular application. But clearly, HDR. Just to give you an idea here, across the United States,、um, from the patient like this is about 0.9 million patients here for all those yellow. HDR is actually used to treat the early stage.、Um, Cancer patients in this area, and and basically, so among that is about like 0.5 million of them is actually receiving HDR、um, treatment itself. And as I mentioned, the cancer patients are getting younger, and many of them want to be able to have kids. And so now they don't just want to preserve the organ; they want to preserve the functioning of the organ. So this becomes really important. On the other hand, what it really means is it drives the clinical field to really. Take a good look at how well can you actually treat these patients, and worldwide, of course, it's about six million patients that will receive this type of treatment. So I insisted in this, thinking about this type of problem instead. It is hard to quantify them by money because if if you look at just、um, cervical cancer, breast cancer, prostate cancer, you got seventy seventy two billion for this、uh, side effect management. You're not talking about everything else, right? You just talk about side. Effect management. So, so it is a huge amount of dollar. But on the other hand, it is hard for us to quantify the dollar because if patients actually die, so it does not matter how much we actually save, right? In that sense. So in this case, we really think about saving lives, and we also understand that the consequence of the work is that it also saves a lot of dollars in terms of the side effect management. But at the end, it is really the patient that actually really、uh, counts. I remember I have、um, a, a colleague from England. Actually, not a colleague, a patient calling me, and tell me how good his、uh, treatment was. And because he called me and asked me what's the best treatment, I say okay. I say there's one place you can do the clinical trial. You have to go there. And and I was really happy that like he would call me and tell me it really works. I say great. Of course, if it does not work, then I don't know, right? It's it's、like, there's a lot of、um, gamble there. But on the other hand, I think so far we have been very fortunate because I have to say.、Um, Our preliminary results for this trial are very encouraging. We believe similar approaches can be applied to other types of cancers as well. This will help pave the way to personalize the medicine, which may lead to better treatment outcomes as well as at reduce the cost. But I do want to say I really do thank my medical colleagues because a lot of times we can do really great work. But it takes a leap of faith that they really think yes, we're going to test it. And for this one, is an actually interesting. They actually do the planning side by side, and so the doctors actually have a choice, just exactly like what we did in the brain tumor and prostate. And the doctors just choose the 
the one, the best one. That so so I think it is really exciting. But as I mentioned, I think there's a lot of opportunities for all our people, especially when it comes to really patient care, direct patient care. They have very complex model. I think OR holds the key. But on the other hand, you also notice it is not trivial. That means it's not like a problem that's okay, a piece of cake I can solve it. It is really challenging. Are you willing to take the risk and? Solve it and and you know spend many nights of sleepless nights to get the solution or not. So thank you.